All right, so if everybody is here for um, crocheting for realtors, then you're in the wrong place. You want to leave now. Uh, this is a class on COVID. And what we're going to talk about today is not, um, not directly a marketing thing or anything like that. This is going to be what it appears the effects of COVID will be on the real estate market, what we can anticipate. But from that information, we can glean what it is we need to be talking to our customers about now to help get them where they need to be. Because, I mean, our job is to not just be the person that says, hey, come get in my car, let's go look at properties. I've really never met agents that are think that, you know, driving people around that shouldn't be buying or couldn't be buying is a whole lot of fun. Um, our, our job is to take and not just show people properties, but to give them good real estate advice. Um, one, of the, one of the examples I like to give is if, um, if I went to a stockbroker, right, and I was going to buy some stock, and I said, hey, I've got a little bit of money. I'd like to buy some stock. And he says to me, um, sure, Josh, we can get you some stock. I said, what should I buy? And he says, oh, you need to buy IBM. I'm like, oh, IBM. I've heard of IBM. In fact, I have a Lenovo computer. I know IBM. And um, so I said, sure, let's buy some IBM. So I'm getting ready to sign for my IBM stock. And he says to me, uh, I said to him, actually, why why did you recommend IBM? And he says, oh, that's easy. IBM has a blue logo. I always recommend companies that have blue logos. It's not a very good reason. So I, I say that because I'm fortunately, unfortunately, whatever you want to say, um, I teach all over the country. And one of the questions I ask in a lot of my classes is, so tell me what's good about real estate. And people start to tell me, oh, I got to make my own hours. Said, no, not about the job of being in real estate, but what's good about the product, right? And I usually get something along the lines of a porky pig, which is sort of a, but they don't know what to say. We're supposed to be the real estate professionals in the room, just like I would expect that stockbroker to have a definite opinion on why I should buy that IBM stock if he's going to recommend that to me. I expect him to defend his position, right? So this class is kind of designed around helping you to define your position, where you think real estate's going to go, or at least this is where I think real estate's going to go, and I think the data kind of backs this up, um, so that you can have a great real estate conversation. And the reason for that is there are three things in my time teaching agents, in my time as a listing agent, I am a listing agent. That's all I do. I don't work with buyers. I don't work with renters. I don't advertise. And I still make a very good income from my real estate business. So the way that I've done that is I shoot for three things. I, <laughs> I only work backwards here and tell you this. I didn't know I was shooting for these three things. But when I look back and try to figure out how we, I was able to do what I've done, it was from developing three things. One is the one that I remember them talking to me about back when I got my license, building rapport, right? Rapport is, is what? What do you guys think rapport is? Let, 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 you hit the chat. Let me uh, give you guys a chance to get your fingers loosened up. What do you think rapport is? When you think of rapport, what does that mean to you? Connecting, candor. What else? Trust, harmonious relationship. Sure, those are all ways of, of phrasing it. The way I, empathy, empathy is a good one. Empathy is one that's sadly lacking in a lot of the good ways. A lot of times there's a lot of emotional empathy, but not, not a lot of intellectual empathy. We'll, we'll, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll get a chance to brush across that. Uh, what I like to say, what rapport is, is that they like you, right? And what I mean by that is, does anybody have a friend that if they were to walk in the room, you would immediately get a huge smile on your face and be like, oh my gosh, it's so good to see you. I mean, this friend you have is like, they're awesome. They have the best story. Sometimes you've laughed so hard, you've cried. You thought maybe you've done permanent damage to your cheeks. They make you smile and laugh so hard. You love this person. I mean, the stories they tell about the time they did a little bit too much of a prohibited substance in the back of a limousine, covered themselves in honey, ran naked through the woods, had the bear chasing them, jumped over the fence, landed on the trampoline with a pit bull on the trampoline. They jumped in the pool, just managed to get away from the police. That friend, they have the craziest, best stories. 
would you want that person babysitting your kid? What do you guys think? That sounds like a, a high quality babysitting option. I'm checking the chat. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. The person that covers themselves in honey and runs naked to the woods is probably not the first person I would choose to. Uh... <laughs> this is probably true, Shereen. That's hilarious. Odds are that's not the person you want watching your little kids, right? Might be good for something else, but not probably for that. So that being said, we need something else. Because obviously, much like watching kids selling a property, listing a property or even working with a buyer has a lot more responsibility, has a lot of responsibility associated with it, right? So the second thing that we need, and this is the big one, and this is where a lot of agents kind of have the idea they need this, um, but they don't actively think about it, is credibility. And that says the person that I'm talking to really knows their stuff. They know what they're talking about, right? When, when I ask them about the market, they don't just answer my question, they answer way more than my question, and it's because they, they're, everything they say comes from this tremendous breadth of knowledge they have of what's going on in their industry. And that's the thing that I wanna center on, is this, guys. This is your industry. You need to know about as much about it as you possibly can. Because when people are coming to you, they're coming to you as the real estate professional in the room. And I'm telling you all of this because the best way I've ever found to develop credibility is not to bring a 67 page listing book with a virtual reality pop up of my broker explaining the 150 year history of our brokerage or anything like that. When I go for a listing, I bring one piece of paper and my listing agreement, that's it. Right? The way that I develop credibility, the way to develop credibility that is the most painless way for the customer, because they see that 67 page listing book, you know they're cringing inside. They don't want to read it. The best way to do it is a quality real estate conversation. I've been talking about this for years. And when this, when this virus hit, I said, you know what? Let me do a class that's just a, a class on having a good conversation about a topic, a good real estate conversation. And thinking more about it, I said, you know what? Let me do it in such a way that I'm going to ask you guys a bunch of questions. So that it's not just me telling you, hey, this is my real estate conversation. This is you, me showing you that I know a lot about real estate. But it's to show you that, to help you guys to see that the data, the things you need to look for to develop your own real estate conversation. So when the next thing happens, you don't have to be looking for somebody like me or somebody else to take and say, hey, this is what we think it's going to be going. You can say, hey, I think it's going to be going here and this is why. I want to give you the ability to build credibility every time a new thing comes along. It's a new opportunity for you to develop uh, a conversation that's gonna keep you in the conversation. If you wanna know what the third thing is, remind me at the end and I'll tell you what the third thing you need for building lifelong customers is. Last piece I'm gonna leave you before we actually kick this off is this, the whole concept of the A series of courses, this is kind of a little brother to my A series of classes that I teach, is the idea that I don't believe success is measured in closing transactions. That is one of the biggest mistakes that you'll ever make in this business. Success is measured in this business by closing customers for life. If you get paid, that's just an indication that you've at least done the minimum to get the deal closed. The question that's going to determine whether or not you've been successful is will this customer do business with any other agent but me by the time this deal is done? And if they won't do business with anyone else but you, now you've built the business. You've not just taken and kept the lights on. You've built toward the future of your business to the repeat business of your the, the repeat business of your business. You've grown. All right. I think that's all the pre-work I wanted to go over with you guys. Um, let's get in here and let's start with a couple of questions. I'm not going to ask you guys for the, the, the top two, but in the chat, if you would, what do you want to learn today and what scares you most in real estate? What do you guys think? What do you want to learn and what scares you the most in real estate? It's a good one. 
learn something different? Vulnerability? The vulnerability of the market, do you mean? Uh, Shereen? Volatility. Absolutely, we're going to talk about volatility. Volatility is an important part of this because real estate actually has shown its um, its ability to not be as volatile as some of the other alternatives that investors and other people have been using. How to handle the deals during COVID? Sure. Absolutely, Leslie. That's a, that's a very good one. Um, Leslie says what scares the most is being able to give customers basically good information. If the thing that scares me most in this business, realistically, as an agent, as a broker, uh, as a uh, investment fund manager, is always giving bad advice. Um, that's terrifying to me because it's all about reputation. Um, where I think this is heading, sure, we'll absolutely cover that. Absolutely, buyers and sellers are more hesitant, and the actual available inventory has shrunk because listed people are not putting their properties on the market to sell. Um, that has been kind of a, a topic, whereas demand hasn't really dropped all that much. We'll look at that. Uh, all right. Moving on, this is who I am. Um, I've got a couple of real estate designations, and a few more. Got a few other licenses. Top selling agent since 2008. I ran a manager real estate investment fund, in addition to having several businesses associated with real estate. Wrote the A series of courses, Roadmap to the American Dream. And my, as I said, my, my biggest fear is uh, giving customers bad advice. I wrote a book called Roadmap to the American Dream. I'm not going to talk about that other than I did it. Um, this is the other A series of classes. And um, if you're interested in, in what I teach or where I teach, that's the website to find me. I am on Instagram, breezing through this stuff to get you guys to this. All right, guys, we're going to go to Kahoot.it. And that is going to, we're going to take and ask some questions really quickly. Let me find it. It's going to add, you're going to go to www.kahoot.it. It's going to ask you for a screen name. It's going to ask you for a game pin first which is that 6495869. And then it's going to ask you for a screen name, pick a screen name that you like. Welcome, Zach. Dumb and dumber, that's funny. Joanne asks, would like to learn how to be a concierge agent versus a volume agent. Sure, there is a lot of litigation in the industry, and there's 100%, Joanne, you're, you're right. Litigation is a frightening part of things, but there's litigation in everything. Um, what you want to take and make sure is you're getting your legal updates. Um, you're not engaging in things. So, like, I'll give you an example. I'm in Florida. Down here in Florida, 
Um, there is one lease that as a real estate agent, I can take and do. It is the only lease I'm allowed to do. Um, if I do any other lease, I open myself up for all kinds of problems with both my license and liability. I own a property management company. I have a lease for that property management company that is not the state lease. Now, my property managers who are not licensed can take and fill that lease out, but I can't. So I had to take a whole bunch of legal clarification to take and make that, uh, figure that out. That being said, um, that's an example of the kind of things that you have to pay attention to um, if you're going to take and do this. All right, guys, I'm going to give you two more minutes, and then we're going to start this sucker up. All right? It's www.kahoot.it. The game pin is 6495869, and it asks you for a screen name. Just uh, no dirty screen names, and we'll have some fun. All right, guys, let's go. Ready? Let's do it. What do we need to be able to have about COVID-19? Strict understanding of the social distancing guidelines, a sharp stick to keep people at least six feet away, a quality discussion about its effects, a special addendum in case the state has to close back down. Guys, as agents, it's important for us to be able to discuss this topic because as a couple of you said, this is a question the customers are asking about. The guidelines for us are fairly similar to most, most residential, most, most average people. What we need to be have at, in order to be professionals of what we do is to be able to talk about it to our customers in a meaningful way. All right, learner, brought off the early lead, Zach, hot in the heels. Going into the crisis, how, much, how is the economy doing? Strong, weak, meh, so-so, entering a recession. Well, that's an interesting distribution. All right, for most indicators, uh, while time-wise we probably should have been entering a recession a long time ago, it hadn't happened. Most of the indicators were that things were really, really good. Uh, unemployment was low, things were good, uh, economy-wise. What changed? What caused the economy to stop? Lack of supply, government force, businesses not wanting to be open, that we all wanted to take a couple of months off. Very good. It's not that we didn't want to go out and do things. We got told we couldn't go out and do things, right? So is the amount of demand that we have in the market a clear indication of what the actual demand is? It doesn't appear that it can be because people are maybe want to do things. They can't. Learner, you're on fire, bud. How was unemployment going into COVID-19? Very low. Decent, but not too low. Hi, I'm in real estate, which means I think I'm always kind of unemployed. It was very low. It was very low. It was historically low. So that's where we're coming from. It's very important to get where we're coming from. That's why I asked that question. 
Should we look ahead for ways to make money from the crisis? Yes, we should. No way, that's immoral. Can you repeat the question? It is not our responsibility to do this as agents. And I find this meme very funny. There we go. I don't have to explain that one. Absolutely, guys. Our customers are depending upon us. All right. Nick, I think you're the only one that's got a shot at Lerner. Smelly feet and Nick, you guys are tight, actually. Let's see how this goes. Last two questions, guys. Will COVID be good for real estate? Yes, all real estate will do great. No, all, no, all real estate will be hurt by this. Yes, some real estate will do well. No, it's the end of the world and I'm stockpiling MREs and ammunition. Some of you probably pushed the red one and thought, oh, shoot, the yellow one. There's some real estate, the guys, that I don't think is ever going to recover from this. Um, I think a lot of real estate will do very well from this for reasons that we'll go over, but I think there's some stuff that just won't. Um, let me give you an example. How do you guys think commercial office is going to do coming out of this after everybody has been forced to work from home and companies have found out that they can get as much production from people from home as they can if they come to the office? You think the company would mind saving the rent on all that office space? Do you think the people that normally work in an office would mind saving all the money and time they spend commuting back and forth? We'll talk more about that in a little bit. Smelly feet and Donna tight at the top. Last question, guys. What will have the biggest effect on real estate? The checks sent to individuals for $1,200 per adult and $500 per child. The money lent to businesses through the PPP and SBA. The money used to fund the stimulus, the bailouts of airlines and other large corporations. The answers are coming in slower on this one. <laughs> Margaret, you nailed it in one. Absolutely. The money used to fund the stimulus. Why? Well, guys, that money had to come from someplace. And when money is created, there's an effect that it has on the economy and on the value of people. Wait a second, I can't leave. We have to see how this, this turned out. It's very important stuff here. Third place, smelly feeds. Second place, Cat Cat. Nice come from behind, Cat Cat. I think I know which way this is going. Learn her. Nicely done. All right. Let's get to the meat of this thing. And let me open this PowerPoint back up again for you guys. There we go. All right. Why a conversation? We've got to be able to have a conversation because it's important to talk about this stuff. Things that matter to customers, right? We, we, we get in conversations with customers and we hear things. Oh, one of the questions that drives me nuts. Customers say, so how's the market when they hear that we're in real estate? And we say something like, it's great. So could I get one of those hot dogs over there? And we immediately change topics. Once again, the ability to have a conversation, the ability to discuss intelligently the market that you're in, the business that you're in is super critical. This is a topic of interest. Everybody's talking about this, right? So this is the reason take and have this conversation. Um, it's an opportunity to bring value to the customer in general. We can take and give them thoughts and ideas that they didn't have before makes them think and also make them think that we might be a person they want to work with. It's a chance to gain credibility. This is 100% a credibility type conversation. This is where it starts. All right. Which is different than most things. Most of the time that we're taking and meeting customers, we're starting with rapport. We're trying to get them to like us. This is the kind of thing that if you know what's going on, if you can have a conversation about this, you can hear somebody talking over your shoulder about this and say, Hey, I, I don't know. I heard what you guys are saying. And did you know, this, that, and the other thing, and all of a sudden you're in the conversation, they're interested, and you just maybe potentially met a couple of new customers. Um, 
let's be honest in our industry, the level of thought on a lot of these things isn't probably as high as it should be. Um, that being said, this gives you the opportunity to sound different, to be different. Um, and it's an opportunity to work backwards from the poor interest. Okay, the topic at hand. What has happened to the economy? The economy was good before the virus hit, right? We kind of, we kind of agree with that. What caused the economy to be bad? They said, you can't, you can't go out and buy stuff anymore. Stay home, right? What is the current unemployment rate? I'm checking the chat for this one. This is a little bit of homework. As of the last time that the number came out, what was it? As a real estate agent, that is critical information for you to always have. Dennis, 19. Veronica, 15. I'm going to put it this way. Veronica is closer than Dennis and closer than... There we go. Shireen got it. 13-ish. It's, Veronica's got it right. 13.3%. Now, guys, it's a big deal because they were expecting it to be closer to 20. And it jumped back down to 13.3. Um that matters because, again, when I wrote this at the very beginning of this thing, but this has always been, if you're going to take and have this kind of conversation with somebody, the thing that you need to track is unemployment. The reason why is, what is the first thing the mortgage broker wants to know? Do you have a job? What do you get paid, right? So there's two things that come from that. One, we want to track unemployment, and the other thing we want to track is wages. Those two things are critical to us to know what's going on in the market, all right? To what extent, and this is an, more of an opinion question, but this is an opinion that you should have, to what extent do you think that this goes away as we continue to reopen? Where do you think this number sort of settles at as we reopen? I mean, it doesn't go back to the record low unemployment that we were at. Where do you think it goes, guys? Ten? Okay, six, that's a good point. Uh, employers are definitely abating expenses and they, they've dipped into a lot of things like, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later, but uh, things like reserves for uh, research and development and things like that have been tapped into to keep their companies afloat. Sure, um, I, I think the number probably is in this the six to eight range someplace. I think that we'll see a nice, another big jump in uh, people being reemployed. But I mean, at the same time, there's been huge hits to a lot of the big industries like travel um, and services. Um, this is a question that most, that definitely the news is not talking about. Although I did see an article on it the other day. Have people been saved? What do you think? Have people been forced to save possibly through this? Because if we have 13.3% unemployment, that means 86.7% of people are, are still employed. And let's say 80% of those at least are still as employed as they were. They're not underemployed. They haven't been significantly cut. Have the people whose income has been largely unaffected by this, have they been forced to save? What do you think? Spend less for sure, right? Let me ask you a question. Has anybody taken a European vacation recently? Anybody bought season tickets to a sporting event? Gone to a concert? <laughs> it was canceled. <laughs> Sorry, Robert. Absolutely. Right? These things have gone away. These big ticket items. It, most people didn't even buy cars. I was just looking at cars the other day. The, the, the financing offers they're offering are, are ridiculous just because they're desperate to sell cars. People aren't really leaving, aren't going out and spending. What does that mean to us as agents? If they have money, maybe for the first time, because Americans are terrible at saving, what does that mean they might have that we might care about? A down payment. You're right, Robert, 100%. The article that I read the other day said it was something, I don't remember the exact numbers and I should have. It was something like American savings had gone from um, 3% of their income to like 43% of their income or 38%, something like that. It was, it was a, a, a massive jump through March, April, and May. And I remember thinking to myself, well, gee, that might be the first time those people's bank accounts have seen that kind of activity. Um, Joanna, I hear what you're saying about financial responsible people saving their money. 
Um, you're right, but Americans are notoriously financially irresponsible. We are the worst savers in the world. Um, Veronica, absolutely, 100%. What should, she's asking, what should the talking points be to buyers who are qualified but very, very cautious? We're going to get to that. That's absolutely where we're going with this because there are some real incentives, some real economic incentives to buyers now uh, that, that matter. All right. Does that translate into pent-up demand? Does everything that we know about Americans historically tell us that they have a bunch of money sitting in the bank that they haven't been allowed to spend. Do you think that there is going to be some spending as people are allowed to spend their money, as they, they get that ability back? Probably so, right? So let's talk about confidence because there is a, a major competitor that real estate has that we don't, typically, we don't typically talk about. The stock market. The stock market is a competitor to us, especially for investor dollars. And investor dollars matter. How is the stock market reacting to this situation? Down. It did go down. Actually, it's come back, way back up. But did the stock market react incredibly volatilely to the situation, losing a third of its value in a day? And I'm sorry, in a couple of weeks. A day. Yes, it did. It went from 29,000 to 19,000 in the course of a couple of weeks, right? Does that make, if you were an investor, does that make you feel good? I think it makes you feel the other thing, the opposite of good, the other one, right? Does that affect people's confidence in the stock market in general? Certainly it does. Now understand the amount of investment dollars that we have right now in the market prior to this, let's say, was kind of fixed. People had looked at how much risk there was in the stock market and what kind of return they were getting, and they figured it then put so much of their money in the stock market and so much in real estate. If that balance changes, their assessment of risk, what their perception of the stock market is, it throws off that balance and starts to take and move more money to the other side. So we have to be aware of that. There may be opportunities where investors are concerned. How has real estate handled this situation? Let me ask it a different way. Has real estate been more or less volatile in the stock market? Less, like a lot less, right, Veronica? Like way, way less. Is that a good thing? One of the main things that investors assess, there's two things that investors assess, return and risk, right? Volatility is risky because what if you need to liquidate? Now, obviously real estate has its problems with liquidity as well because you don't always necessarily have a buyer for a property when you need to sell it. But our prices haven't really gone down. Does that make a good case for comparing real estate to the stock market? I think it does. I mean, especially considering the last 10 years, nobody's really seen this kind of volatility. Have prices changed much in real estate since this happened? No, they haven't. Everybody's saying the prices are going to go way down. Everybody was expecting a wave of foreclosures to come hit our way. Um, let me ask a question. What do you guys think? Do you think there's a wave of foreclosures coming this way? Veronica, you do? Okay. You expect more foreclosures? Sure. It's reasonable to expect more foreclosures. Absolutely. But let me ask you a question. If I'm forced to sell my property because I can't pay my mortgage, and if I have this thing called equity, am I a foreclosure? Veronica, you're, you're right. If there's, if I, if there's, there's been a type of forbearance, which I've seen a lot. Everybody talks about the, the other kind of forbearance where they basically take and give you a balloon payment at the end of three months. Most of the forbearance that I've seen, the banks have been, been very good with actually taking the last three months, the, the, the three months of uh, March, April, and May, and tacking them onto the end of the loan um, and just adjusting the interest accordingly, which I think is a much more elegant solution than just simply expecting a, 
uh, a balloon payment at the end of three months. Uh, Iris, I'm 100% going to talk about commercial real estate in a little bit. Yes, I expect more foreclosure. Depends. It's a significant increase in inventory. Well, Joanna, right now, uh, and I have to ask, guys, because obviously I am on the other side of the country. I know what the situation is with my market here. There's a tremendous demand for single-family home product, and there really isn't enough of it. Is that what you guys see there? Do you have a lack of inventory? Is there a lot of new inventory coming out of the ground? What do you guys see? Lack of inventory. Yes. So if there was more inventory, do you think the market could bear having more inventory right now? If that's the case, as long as there's not a massive wave of foreclosures, theoretically prices shouldn't tumble. It would just actually go to meet market demand. Am I, am I correct in, in thinking that? What do you guys think? There are enough buyers desperate to buy. Okay, so if that's the case, what does that mean for our, our market? It means that even if there are foreclosures, there's not going to be a significant dip in prices, probably. And if there's not a significant dip in prices, most of those folks that are in their home that have to get out because they've lost their job or whatever, can sell their home with equity in the property, which means it's no, not a short sale or a foreclosure. It is a regular arm's length transaction where the person is just walking away. Um, it would be a distressed sale only if you found out the details of the seller's information, which honestly, if I was their listing agent, I would never disclose to you. I mean, I might say that I have a motivated seller, but I wouldn't tell you necessarily why. There's no reason, at least in my market, uh, where that's a necessary, necessary disclosure to make, right? Why would, you, why would I disclose that? Um, my job is to take and protect my seller's interest if I'm a listing agent, right? Um, you, buy, you folks that are dealing with buyers, you're probably desperate to get a hold of inventory, right? Um, so finding a property, okay. Uh, Conrad, you're 100% right. A lot of the, the thinking that we have right now is, is hung up on the, the 2008 financial crisis. And we're going to kind of touch on that a little bit when we talk about inflation. Um, because a lot of people are sitting here saying, well, you know, um, they dumped a bunch of money in the economy in 2008 and it didn't have an inflationary effect. We're going to get there because a lot of what we're going to talk about is going to hinge upon that. I agree that I don't think foreclosure will be a material issue for a few reasons. One, uh, the banks learned very well in 2008 that they hate owning real estate. Guys, it's a dirty secret of banks. Banks do not like owning real estate. They're not in the business of owning real estate. It's bad for them on their books. It's bad for them with the reserves. It's bad for their business, right? So they, they don't want to own real estate. So that's why their forbearance response was very quick this time around. All right. By the way, guys, I'm watching both the chat and the, the question. I got them both open on another screen, so I'm trying to stay on top of stuff uh, for you. How does real estate look in comparison to the stock market right now compared to the way it did, say, six months ago? Better or worse? It's still looking better. I mean, the stock market had a lot going for it. It had really done well for quite a while here. Good. Okay. Wait a second. There we go. Let's talk about the bailout because that's the next thing that we gotta ha we're gonna have to go over. If we're gonna take and cover this topic well. What will be the result of the bailout of the bailout funds? Well, let me ask it this way: Has money become less scarce? The government injected close to $3 trillion from the, from the legislative branches of government and another $4 trillion from the Federal Reserve. So we have a split opinion. If there is $7 trillion additional dollars that have basically just been introduced to the economy, is there more or less money there? There's more money. Absolutely. I, I see that the, the credit standards have tightened some. You're right, Nick, uh, especially when it comes to commercial lending. They are getting very tight. I'm actually going to cover that at the very end of this uh, as one caveat. That's something that I'm dealing with personally with when it comes to my investment fund. Um, what is it called when money becomes less scarce? What do we call it? There's a, there's a name that we have for what happens when money becomes less scarce. 
credit crunch? No, actually. There it is, Joanna. Joanna nailed it in one. Inflation. Veronica as well. You both get equal credit on that. We experience inflation. Why is that on there twice? Okay. What is one of the best investments to be in when we are in an inflationary economy? What do you think it is, guys? I'll give you a hint. You're in that industry. Real estate. All right, Shireen, because you said that, and honestly, I was going to probably do this anyway, guys, I'm going to give you kind of an analogy to get your head around this. I use this analogy all the time with customers because it works well and helps them to get their mind around this inflation thing because everybody hears about it, but the people don't really understand it super well, all right? When I was a kid, my first job, I was nine years old. I used to load the vending machines for my father, all right? And I would load the Coca-Cola, just cans of Coke, right? And I clearly remember the can of Coke cost 50 cents. That same can of Coke from that same vending machine is a buck and a half today. I wish I still had the vending machine spoof, right? What happened? Did the can of Coke get better? Did they change the recipe? What do you guys think? Did the recipe be different than it was 30 years ago when I was a kid loading the vending machines? No? Um, I know. Does the vending machine make it colder? Is it a better product I'm paying for? Hmm. No. I know, is the can made out of some new space age material? No, what's happened is the money supply has expanded. The value of the money itself has become less, okay? So when a quarter used to be able to go get his friend another quarter and go buy me a can of Coke, he's gotta go get five of his buddies to do the exact same job, right? So here's the thing, what do you think would've happened? And this goes directly to your point, Sheree if I had put my 50 cents in the bank 30 years ago with compounding interest daily for the last 30 years, how much money do you think my 50 cents would have grown into today? Take a guess, guys. I'm the only one nerdy enough here to actually use the financial calculator to figure this out. A lot, that's a, that's a good guess, triple, $2. Christina, you're closest to being right. My 50 cents would have turned into 56 cents. Because here's the problem. The bank doesn't pay interest rates that are high enough to keep pace with the way the money is losing value. In other words, imagine a bucket that they're slowly dropping water into, but it has a bigger hole at the bottom than they're dripping water into it. It's so the reason why the people that get killed most in an inflationary economy are two groups. Those that are on a fixed income, so they get $500 a month. Well, the thing is if $500 a month only buys $400 a month worth of stuff now because the money is less valuable, they've effectively lost $100. The other ones that get killed are people that are saving their money. Let me ask you a question, guys. Where is our customer's money when it's not buying property? Where do they usually get their money from to make their down payment? Stocks, not most of the customers that I run into. That's a good, that's a good one, 401k. There it is, Christina. The vast majority of people take the money out of their savings account, especially your first time home buyers. If you're talking about high end buyers, yes, maybe 401ks, maybe, maybe uh, stocks. Well, if, let me ask you a question. What if I did this? What if instead of buying the can of Coke when I was a kid for 50 cents, or instead of buying it and drinking it, I bought it and I saved the can of Coke. And we've all said that the can is the same, the vending machine is the same, the recipe of the Coke is the same. If somehow I made it so that can of Coke didn't go bad, could I load that can of Coke today in the vending machine and sell it for $1.50? What do you guys think? I could. Does that mean that Coke outperforms the savings account by like three to one or more than that actually? Should I be backing my car up to the local, the local uh, wholesale store and putting cases of Coke in there with my extra commission money? Is that the play I should be making right now? Where the heck do I store all that? Is there any other investment in the universe that we can think of that automatically does what the can of Coke does? Any thoughts? That's right, Christina. Nailed it in one. Real estate. Joanna, you had it as well. Guys, we have been in a, in a historically low inflationary market for quite a while, right? 
real estate still did pretty well over the stretch since 2008, right? 2009, 2010, whenever we kind of bottomed out. We've done really, really well for a, quite a long time, actually, historically long time. I, I would put forth that a lot of that reasoning is just simply the recovery took as long as it did. But could you imagine if we're in an inflationary market, how real estate will do? Well, let's talk about why real estate does well. The price of the real estate, like the can of Coke, goes up with the devaluation of the money. It automatically adjusts because people are always willing to exchange a certain amount of their income for a certain kind of house. And when money becomes less valuable, wages have to automatically go up just to keep people from not losing ground. It cost a dollar to buy my, my lunch before, and now it costs $2. Well, I have to give that, that employee more money just so they can afford to live the same way they were living before. Let me ask you this question. What do you think about mortgages? When you get a mortgage, they lend you the money and you spend the money. Are you spending the money today or are you spending future money that they're giving you? Today, very, very much correct, Joey. We're spending money today. What money are we paying the bank back with? Today money or future money? Future money. If that money is becoming less and less valuable over time, which it always does, but if it's doing so more quickly, are we on the right side of that transaction for a change? Are we actually in a better, we're literally paying the bank back with less and less valuable money. Is that something that customers like to hear? That they feel like they're sticking it to the bank? I want to be honest with you. Every time I tell a customer that, they love it. They love that idea. And guys, that's always been the case. Because if you ask anybody who's getting ready to pay off their 30-year mortgage, what their mortgage payment is, it's some ridiculously small number compared to the value of their house today. But when they made that mortgage originally 30 years ago, that amount represented probably a full third of their income. Now it maybe represents a tenth of their income. That's what happens as money devalues over time. Here's the last one, and this is, this is the one where I think the real opportunity has. So I've given you right there the reason to take and talk to your customer, and we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna hit on that one more time. Second, but let's, let's, cover the, let's cover the investor side of this. The property value goes up to keep pace with inflation, right? We talked about that. What about the rents? Do rents go up to keep pace with inflation? What do you guys think? They do. Isn't, if, if the property goes, value goes up to keep pace with inflation and the rents go up to keep pace with inflation, does that mean I'm double dipping on inflation? What do you guys think? Am I double dipping? I am. That's got to be illegal or immoral, right? No, no, it's just how real estate works. Which means when we're looking at the investment of value of real estate, I'm going to give you guys an, a definition here. This is not an investment class, but this is one of the best definitions I've, heard, I, I've ever heard for investment real estate, understanding it. So I'm going to give it to you just kind of as a freebie. Um, when you buy investment real estate, what you're doing is, and you probably want to write this down, as I said, exchanging money today for a series of future cash flows and a future sale price, okay? This is the reason why if you're using things like cap rate, there's a built-in problem with it. So let me give you that definition again, and maybe you can tell me what the problem is with something like cap rate. You're exchanging money today for a series of future cash flows and a future sale price. For those of you that don't know what a cap rate is, you're comparing what it costs to buy the property to the income the property generates based upon the current rent today. What is missing? What is missing? There's a couple of things missing from a cap rate calculation, truthfully, but what's missing? You guys don't have the answer. Future rent, that's true. Future rent is one, but that's not the big one, but it's a, it's a really good guess. Because the, the calculation that I prefer definitely addresses future rents and the fact that the rents go up over time. Inflation, future value of the property. Nicely done, Yuki. Absolutely, guys. We're not taking into account the future value of the property. Why does that matter? Because we're having a different discussion than we normally have. Normally, as agents, we're talking about comparing two like-kind pieces of real estate. Cap rate is only good for saying, hey, will this office building do better than this office building? 
because what we're assuming is both properties will appreciate about the same way. So we're not going to calculate that in. But if I'm trying to compare my investment in real estate to somebody's stock portfolio, and I'm not taking into account that the property is appreciating over time, am I not selling my product accurately? And am I actually undercutting the performance of my product? What do you think? Sure, we're undercutting it for sure. So let's say real estate t historically appreciates between three and three and a half percent a year, historically, right? Which means if my property is making 10%, I can expect to say over the course of it, if I was to buy it now, forgetting closing costs, guys, just looking at it as a straight investment, because we, even with, the, with stock purchases, you have brokerage fees and things like that. If I look over the course of a year, if I purchase it, have the rent come in and sell it. If I'm making 10% as a cap rate, I should expect to make between 13 and 13 and a half percent as my overall return. Because when I sell that property, I should be able to recognize a profit because it's appreciated in value. Right. Uh, again, not an investment class. Uh, appreciate 7.3% a year. Yeah, guys, that's what you guys have going on out there is, is really quite impressive. Um, I'm not even, I was giving you a national average. It's awesome that you know that. That is a number that you should absolutely have and you have to figure it in to the mix. I mean, I know the cap rates that you guys have out there are, are very low compared to other parts of the country. And it's, it's awesome that, you know, people are willing to take them and spend that for your, for your, for your product. Here's the thing, right, guys. I was, uh, I was teaching a class actually and somebody walked up to me and told me this and I never forgot it. So I, I don't know the guy's name, but I always give him credit for it as best I can. I had just given him the can of Coke thing that I told you guys. And I said, uh, he said to me, uh, do you know what the difference is between experiencing appreciation and inflation? I thought about it for a second. I said, no. He said, ownership. I said, oh, wow, that's good. Because here's the thing. Your customers that are skittish, that are worried, they have two options in this market. They can sit on the sidelines hoping for prices to go down and watching prices go up because money has become less scarce and we therefore have to experience inflation. All the while, while their rents go up, the price of the home they want goes up, the rents go up and the tears come down because they're not gonna be able to afford that house, right? It's gonna be moving away from them. Or option two, they can buy the house and be experiencing that inflation as growth of their equity in their own property getting rid of that, uh, the purchase money, uh, the, the, um, the mortgage insurance, the PMI, uh, as they get below 79.5% uh, LTV, right? Okay, let's talk about employment, because this matters. Will some jobs not come back? What do you think? Sure, some industries, some restaurants are gone, some things are just gone. Let me ask you about that though. What do you guys think? Do you think those things will come back with time? Sure. I mean, people haven't gotten any less hungry. I mean, people will still go to restaurants and eat food. It's just that some restaurants maybe have gone out of business. Will new labor opportunities become available from this? Some business models will change permanently. Actually, I would say that there's, there's a lot that may change permanently. I go to Home Depot a lot. And one of my other businesses, I'm also a general contractor. It, it helps with my investment fund and helps me to get my properties remodeled that we do, right? Um, there's a guy outside of Home Depot whose job is to make sure that I wear a mask. That job didn't exist before COVID. There's another person whose job it is to just take and watch the lines at Home Depot and make sure I go when I'm supposed to. That's another job. Um, I agree, Margaret. I think, yes, with time, most businesses will return. Does immigration affect this? Guys, I know this is, this is probably a political topic. This is an apolitical question. This is a question of just as real estate professionals, because you know what your customer may bring it up. So you have to think it through, right? And you have to give them a good, clean, politically scrubbed answer because you don't want to irritate your customers. Okay. Can you repeat the question? My question is this. Does immigration policy affect, does how immigration occurs affect how this is going to go as far as how the labor market is going to respond?
Sure, it has to have some effect. It has to have some effect. What short what, what short term loss of sales have long will short term loss of sale have long term consequences? This is a little bit tougher question, but this is the thing where I said to you guys, a lot of companies have dipped into reserves, things that they normally used to have for research and development and things like that, in order to float them through this. Um, so you may see a, a um, some uh, interruption in how quickly innovation occurs. And, and if you look at what, it, what has always driven the U.S. economy, it's always been innovation, the new thing um, that comes along that keeps keeps this whole ball moving. Okay. What have the changes to society been recently? What do you guys think? There been a change in the way that we take and do business? The change, way that we change, take and interact with each other? This is where we're getting that commercial real estate bit here in a second. Will there be motor stress property? The answer is probably yes, there will be some. Will it be 2008 reboot? I really don't think so because what caused 2008 was just not an was not simply an influx of supply, a bunch of properties coming on market. It was a complete stop of demand. Not only did everybody want to get rid of their stuff, nobody wanted to buy their stuff. In fact, if you look at the reason why there was so much money injected into the economy in 2008 after the 2008 housing crisis, and there was so little effect on inflation, it was largely because we had all these assets that we had lent on already that had been misvalued. We had lent money based upon these higher values. So we thought the money supply, actually the money supply was acting as if it was larger than it actually should have been. When those assets were misvalued, there were all these tremendous losses and there was a shrinking of the money supply. And that can result in a very bad thing, which is called deflation. Deflation is way worse than inflation for most people. In fact, they, that's something that they've dealt with in, in Japan for a while, which has been very, very bad for their economy. So, the money that was actually put into the economy there was to take and try to bring the money supply back up to a place that better matched where we perceived it to be. Even so, it gave us a very long period here with very, very low inflation, which is why they've been able to keep the interest rates as low as they have for as long as they have. We do have the perfect storm going right now of inflation is still fairly low, it seems, and we have very, very low interest rates, which the Federal Reserve has been talking about keeping through 2022. Is that a good thing for us in real estate? Sure it is, we're very dependent upon people borrowing money. The vast majority of transactions are done with borrowed money. Good for real estate, bad for savings account. Absolutely, Joanna, absolutely. Savings account, again, if you're not investing money at at least three, three and a half percent a year in something, you're losing ground because inflation is brutal. Will people change where and how they live? And these are question, guys. Might people move from the Northeast where they've experienced some of the worst parts of this? Might people be less interested in condo and apartment style living after having been told that only two people per elevator um, or one or not being able to really leave their house because they, you know, they have to see people in the hallway, right? Um, will that affect things? Again, remember that we're at a balance, right? Any little thing throws this off and can create patterns. Will it affect some types of property? I don't know. Could condo, could, could townhome become a more popular product? Because down here where I am, it's very difficult to get any new single family home product built because the cost to build a single family home product is too much for most people to buy. The actual demand is at a price point below what they can build homes for down here. Um, so that creates that creates a problem. Maybe townhome product though becomes more in demand because it's less of a confined communal living. Townhome may become a hotter commodity. Will it affect some areas of the country? As I said, could the Northeast see some migration? Um, possibly so we've already seen some, believe it or not, in, in my neck of the woods. We're actually seeing more people coming down from the Northeast looking to buy over the course of, the, course of the last couple of months. Um, what changes? This is a big one. What changes have there been to how we work? I feel like what we're doing right now is an example of that, right? Do a lot of people, Zoom, right? 
do a lot of people, have a lot of people been able to work from home through all of this? Have a lot of companies which have slow rolled their move to have people work from home because they were worried about how they were going to hold them accountable and how they were going to make sure uh, this is all going to get done. Um, no problem, Leslie. Thanks for hanging. Um, does that does that change? Well, let me ask you a question. As I said before, do you think it would be hard to talk the companies out of having to pay that rent every month? Does that rent come directly out of profits? I mean, if they didn't have to pay that rent, would that money be then profit? Joanna, I've heard the exact same thing. Yes, that people are more productive working from home. Um, that is actually what we've seen because don't forget, people are getting, getting the benefit of not having to commute. Uh, you're just picking up that time. And would it be easy as a company to say how much greener they are because they're not making their people commute back and forth to work? Um, and would it potentially save on childcare costs for people whose children aren't super young? who maybe they just need to be present in the home, but now their kids don't need supervision. Is that a savings to the, to the, to the, uh, to the, the employees? I mean, there's a lot of benefits to this. And for this reason, I don't think that you ever see commercial office come back the way that it was. I, I, I think the commercial office really has a problem. And, and that can result in some, some much higher cap rates and much, much higher rates of returns that they're gonna have to take an offer for prices coming way down. What parts of our industry do you think would be most hurt by this? I kind of feel like I just gave you that answer. What about retail? This is one that people talk about a lot with this thing. What do you think the long-term consequences to retail will be? You think it recovers? Partially, not at all, a little bit, not so much. What do you guys think? Who's brick and mortar stores? Do you think those those losses are gone for good, Joanna? Or do you think they're uh, just some trimming of the the folks that were going to go anyway? What do you think? Small business retail will have more of a difficult time recovering. Absolutely, small the, the the small business retail is definitely gotten hurt by this whole thing. Um, big box has gotten hurt by this whole thing. Um, I mean, I just saw the numbers the other day, just uh, one that you don't necessarily think of as being retail, but it kind of is, um, is um, gyms, 24-hour fitness, declared bankruptcy. They're closing, I think, 148 locations, 128 locations nationwide. That's one of the big players in that, in that space. Um, and, and what's usually a very stable industry because it's a subscription industry, right? Um, but does someone step back in to fill that gap is probably the better question. That, that would have to come, right? Does somebody step in to, to take and replace that mom and pop restaurant that went out of business? Because once again, there's demand. I would agree that when there's a vaccine, uh, things will spring back. Although if you took a look at the retail numbers that came out uh, just today, they were up significantly more than they anticipated. This is all good stuff. This is all signs of, of, of positive movement. Um, something else will fill the gap. I, I agree with that, Joanne. I think that something else will fill the gap because and, and this is theory. I'm not telling you that this is right, but this is my opinion having watched this for a long time. I believe that online is baked into the cake already. And what I mean by that is a couple of years ago, we had, uh, we had some good wage growth from one quarter to the next. And we saw the largest gain for brick and mortar. It actually outpaced um, e-commerce for the first time in a long time. And to me, that was kind of the tipping point saying, hey, you know what? This is probably the place where people are like, you know what? I'm okay buying my socks online, but I want to buy my jeans in a store. And if you guys know what I'm talking about, there's like certain things you want to try on, certain things you want to wear, right? And there's still that, that there's a whole portion of society that, that wants to go out and shop. Guys, as agents, we need to know this because all real estate is our business. Even if we're not doing commercial space, we need to know where it is because our customers might be in that business or in that space. And if we can talk intelligently about it, it separates us from the other agent that's out there, right? All right, guys, we are almost done. How are we doing on time? We're okay. Where are the opportunities? So let's talk about the opportunities before I open up for questions, answers, and, and whatever else. 
buying instead of renting. It's better to experience the appreciation. We, we've already kind of covered that, right? This is the case to be made for your buyers and say, hey, look, guys, the government has introduced $7 trillion into the economy that wasn't there before. That is going to have the result of inflation, all right? I mean, I can tell you guys, just personal experience, we put out for SBA loans and for PPP. We got 70,000, which is not, does not have to be repaid from the SBA, uh, from PPP, and another $485,000 in loans from the SBA that is at three and a half percent interest, uh, I think with 30 day amortization with no payments for a year. Guys, now obviously that was great for my business. It's just more investment that I can take and do. Um, just, you know, kind of almost free money that I only have to beat three and a half percent on to be making money on it, right? Does that affect the cost of things? Well, I can tell you I've hired five new employees. Um, so, Will that affect the price of goods? I think that it has to. And when it does, expect your real estate to go up in, pri in value, and up in price. Um, is there gonna be a push for people wanting less dense living environment, uh, environments? I mean, I think there might be. I, I tend to be the opposite of the germaphobe. So for me, like, I, I would never change how I live, but I know some people that are really, really bothered that are like, I'm never going to own a condo again after this. Um, borrowing money. Is money cheap right now? That's a question I'll let you guys answer. Is money cheap right now? Sure it is. Will inflation work in your favor to pay it off? It is tighter on qualifying for some things. Sure. Train. I, I, I agree with that. Lenders are being cautious. And we can talk about, well, let, let's talk about it right now. Why are lenders being cautious? Lenders are being cautious because they know that a lot of people are suffering liquidity crisis. They've lost jobs and things like that. So they're being much more stringent on the refis and things of that nature. They want to make sure that people's jobs are secure and that they want to mitigate their risk. That's always what a lender's position is, just to mitigate their risk, right? Becoming a landlord. We now have people that have savings, guys. Now, we can, we can think like agents usually do and think about just getting them into a property to live in, but maybe they already have a property that they live in. Maybe they've been working from home for three months. Maybe it's time to say to them, hey, guys, maybe it's time to get your money out of here and put it into something else. I don't know what the, if there are and what they are in your area, but if there are opportunity zones in your area, you should 100% look into that, 100%. Um, it is, um, interestingly enough, it is a proposal that was written by um, Tim Scott and Cory Booker. So talk about two politically out the side of the aisle who came together and came up with what's a pretty good idea, which is that you can take your money out of securities and invest it in an opportunity zone and pay no tax consequence for whatever the profits were that you had made in that money what it, with, with what it was invested in. And if you leave the money in the opportunity zone for, I believe it's 10 years, you can take any profits you make from there and they're tax free. This eliminates the problem that they've had with these types of programs where people come in, invest their money and then leave. So they avoid the tax consequence and forces them to stay there and thus they're tied to the, the long-term benefit of that, that community. Um, this is something 100% that you can talk to your customers about. A lot of your customers are probably just looking to get their their, their skin out of the stock market without getting killed, which the stock market has bounced back largely. But this is an opportunity to get them involved in your you know, two unit, three unit, four unit investment properties, or maybe some of your larger stuff. Um, highly recommend looking for your investment, investor customers right now. This one is, is quite possibly played out right now, but there may still be some of these opportunities now, which are sellers that are overreacting still. Most people have kind of settled down with this thing um, and they're just kind of waiting it out. But I definitely had sellers that lowered their price within the first couple of weeks of this because they wanted to get out and be ready for the zombie apocalypse, which they were sure was coming, right? Um, they, they immediately, after a couple of weeks, raised their price back up again and, and you know, everything is back to normal. Um, but there still may be some of those people out there that think this is just the first shoe and there's going to be, a, you know, a, a huge, another huge outbreak and everything's going to get way worse. Those people, 100%, if they're overreacting to this, it may be an opportunity. Uh, landlords, that, landlords that have not received rent. This, at the beginning when I wrote this, I thought was going to be a much bigger part 
of, of the market. Um, uncollected rents are actually surprisingly really low compared to what they've rejected to be. I don't know what it is out there, uh, what you guys see, but on our end, we've seen landlords collecting over 90% of their normal rent. Um, so is that what you guys see out there? Are landlords collecting most of their rents out there or are you, you seeing a lot of delinquency? What do you guys think? This is my check to make sure you're not completely asleep. What do you think? Landlords collecting most of their rents right now or are they suffering a lot of delinquency and a lot of non-payments? A lot of potential evictions, not a lot. You read something that said yes? Land collecting most of their rents, especially commercial. This is good. This is this is means that a lot of what was perpetuated was, was more fear-mongering than what actually went up being. I mean, luckily this was not nearly as bad as what they said it was going to be, and hopefully it continues to be that way. Hope, hopefully we outperform. Many are working with renters. I can tell you from my property management customer company, with the properties that I own, I only had one. And I think total with all the properties we managed, there was only one my one and one other one that had, a, had an issue with paying rents. Um, on commercial, both might there be opportunities in retail um, and also potentially might in the future there be tremendous opportunities for office space if somebody can figure out a way to take in and make that space work. Oh, absolutely, Joanna. There's definitely people that, that try to take advantage of it no matter what. It, they, they think they can get away with it. Oh, the courts are closed. You can't file eviction. Okay, well, I, I guess I can't pay my rent. Um, absolutely. I, I would say to you guys, um, a lot of that is going to help. This is kind of, I, I don't normally give this in this class, but I'm going to toss it out there just as a, as a tip, as, as a, both a landlord and somebody that runs a, a property management company. Having a lease that's very strong when your tenant does go into delinquency, that if they, you do have to file for, um, for eviction, that they automatically lose their security deposit, um, that it's, it's already gone. Um, it gives you more, it puts you in a better position to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to. I've always been a believer in doing as my as a landlord, whatever that needs to be done. If there's something broken, I'm there that day, right? But I want to make sure my tenant holds up there under the bargain. So having a good lease is a very big part of that, um, 100%. That's a little, just a little side tip. All right, issues can be, I know you guys have brought up a couple times, can be financing as lenders are practicing social distancing from lending right now, it seems like. Um, lenders are very cautious. They know that a lot of people, a lot of companies, a lot of people have liquidity issues. They've lost jobs, they need income because they're losing income other places. Um, lending is supposed to start to reopen as far as commercial lending is supposed to start opening up again middle of this month, any day now, um, and more fully as, as time goes on. I know for me, with my industry, uh, we do a lot of cash out refinances because we buy non-performing mortgages, um, take the properties back, renovate them, get them rented, and then we go to refinance them. Well, there are no cash out refinances right now. Um, and the problem for me is actually I have pools of, of these properties that are coming due in September, October, and these loans take a long time to get done. And so I need to be working on them, you know, mid July. Um, that being said, this is something that matters. Last piece, which is questions, guys. If you have any questions, answers, insults, puns, limericks, I'll take anything. I'm glad I could help, Conrad. If that's it, guys, that's all I got for you today. You can catch out a little early. Can property management still charge a lease break fee? Um, that is going to be a state specific question. 100%. Um, you want to take, um, I imagine that you have a legal hotline as a realtor that you can call and ask because each state, how they handle this is different. You're going to want, when it comes to a lease, you're going to want, I always have my eviction attorney create my lease for me. Um, that's who does it. You're going to need to find out as an agent, whether or not you can use a lease that's from another source because that's also very state specific. Um, so again, I, I hate to kick the can and say, hey, go ask the attorney, but in this case, um, 
what will happen when people all right that's a good question veronica uh there's there's two things that may happen one it may incentivize people to to find jobs if there are jobs um christina I, i'm glad you i'm glad you had fun um the other option is that you may start to see some more delinquencies and, and then there'll be a better ability to assess what the full scope of the problem really uh, was um thank you uh, I'm fine with you sharing it. I, I suppose that's a, that's a Nikki question. Uh, my pleasure, Shireen. Um, let me just uh, make sure. Because of COVID. Oh, because of COVID. Um, all right. So that's that's a good question, Robert. And I, let me kind of circle to this because one of the questions is, that I asked is, you know, do you need a coronavirus addendum to your paperwork, to your contracts, and things like that? Technically, probably not. Um, should you have one? Probably so. And here's why. I, actually, I was on the phone uh, on a podcast the other day with, a, with an attorney, and we were discussing this issue. And he, say, he said basically this. Your contract, all contracts, have a force majeure clause in them. I'm sure your real estate co contract, if I was to look through it, I'm sure I'd find it. Right? And a force majeure is basically an act of God, which basically says, if for no fault of either of the parties, some terrible thing happens and makes it so we can't close this deal, basically... We extend the contract. The kind of the deal is we, we can renegotiate, right? Uh, um, and so the the COVID addendums, which most um, states have come up with, is basically a way to sit here and say, hey, rather than just leaving it to force majeure and kind of figuring out what to do when it happens, this is going to take and lock us in. If this does happen, then we're going to do this. Right? So the force majeure is now identified, and if there is this force majeure, this is what we're going to do. Um, does that make sense, Robert? Um, so I think that depending upon the language in your lease, you can probably charge a lease break fee um, if, the, um, if the lease and the law allows for it. As I said, it's state-specific, so I have, to, I have to once again point you in the direction of the attorney. Um, is that when all... Is that when we'll see more foreclosures? Yes, Veronica, potentially that, that could be. Um, absolutely. Uh, we'll do, thank you. Uh, this was very, let me just make sure I got everybody's questions. You know, what, what is your background? My background? <laughs> a, a lot of real estate. Um, before I was uh, managed a fund and was a broker since 2008, and uh, I have just about every real estate designation on a man. Before that, though, uh, my father was the single largest landowner in, in Brooklyn for a couple of decades. Um, so we sold a lot of that real estate uh, before I came along, but I was uh, part of that. So I learned a lot through that. Um, I'm glad guys in any way that this helped. Um, it's, it's different than a lot of what I normally do. Normally what I do is, is show you how to be, you know, tricks and things to be a better agent, but this is just more how to have a great conversation with folks so that you can ask them, you know, if you were to ask them after the conversation, say, hey, do you think I know anything about real estate? They say, oh, yeah, yeah, you do. Without you ever sitting here saying, well, let me tell you how many years I've been in real estate. Let me tell you how many sales I did. Let me tell you. That all comes off as bragging to the customer. So this is a way to avoid the bragging. Uh, and so I hope, I hope this helps. Um, if so, hopefully I see you guys again sometime uh, for something else. Anything else you need? Let me know. I'm, I'm watching. Great. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.